Pan Pan Psychast. Part two: How to use it. So, in our previous instalment, we diagnosed the problem that is. We're always busy, we're stuck in the efficiency trap every time we accomplish our goals, more goals arise, and that we don't embrace our finitude. I, we pretend as if our lives are going to go on forever, as if we could do all the things that we wanted to in the world, and we don't want to close our options down and accept the fact that one day we're going to die. So in this installment, we're going to give the cheery side of that, the other side of the hill. We've climbed the horrible mountain of truth, and now we're going to ride down on the sleigh of happiness and make the journey worth it, <laughs> and also come up with better analogies. Should we talk about finitude first of all, and, and what Burton thinks we should do in the face of the facts that we only have 4,000 weeks? Yeah, so for finitude, so he really comes back to Heidegger for that, about the fact that finitude in Heidegger's eyes is what defines our existence. So to live a really, truly authentic life, so to become fully human means facing that. So being aware that we are limited and aware that this is it. So this is not a dress rehearsal and there's nothing coming later. So this is really our life to live now. So Heidegger calls this mode of existence being towards death. So it's really being aware of death is what allows us to live fully now and to experience the world as it truly is. I thought there was a really nice quote in the book on that point that Heidegger brings up from uh, Marion Coots, who's talking about her husband, Tom LeBuck, the art critic, who called her to say that he would be dying within three years from a brain tumor when she was taking her child to school. And the quote from a, a memoir here, quote, we learn something, we are mortal. You might say you know this, but you don't. It is as if a new physical law has been described for us, bespoke, absolute as all the others are, yet terrifyingly casual. It is a law of perception. It says, you will lose everything that catches your eye. And there's that sense of, we start to take everything for granted in that really obvious sense. But when we realize again that this is it, that this is the only chance we get at existing, then we regain that sense of awe and appreciation for the world around us. Yeah, so instead of feeling ripped off that time should be taken away, mm. it's really flipping our attitude and saying that, trying to make us appreciate that we have it in the first place and how amazing that we're beings and we're alive and that there's a whole world which is also being in the first place. So it really is a shift in attitude. So it's a bit of a glass half full situation. So rather than seeing the empty side, it's mm. really appreciating what we have and that allows us to live more fully. Do you think Berkman's point could be captured in the following way? If he'd had a few pints and were like, Berkman, explain your idea. And he said something like, you don't deserve any time in the first place. Like you're not owed any time. So you should be grateful for any time that you do get. You shouldn't go, ah, oh, it's so unfair that I only get 4,000 weeks. Go, Here's a gift of 4,000 weeks and embrace them and try and actually enjoy them. Yeah, it makes you appreciate to spend your finite time on what really matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the main thrust of this book is a shift in perspective, right? So it's not just, oh my God, 4,000 weeks. I've got to cram everything into those 4,000 weeks. It's no, pause for a second and make some meaningful choices mm. and prioritize the things that have meaning for you. Uh, this is very interesting. The connection there to Heidegger is really fascinating. I like that link in the book, but he's not the first philosopher to be talking about this as well. So if we can go back to ancient Rome, for example, Heidegger is not the first philosopher to talk about the finitude of life. We've also got our main Stoic philosopher from ancient Rome, Seneca, right? So this was something that Seneca was really interested about as well on his writing called On the Shortness of Life, where he effectively is he's very critical of other Romans at mm. the time for doing specific things. So he says things like, why do many people in, in his time pursue political careers they don't want to do? Why do they hold big grand banquets where everybody gets really drunk and is sick everywhere, which was a thing back in ancient Rome, right? Why are they doing that if they don't want to? And he also says, quote, why do they bake their bodies in the sun? So the question, Jack, is what's Seneca got against banqueting, sunbathing and politics? What's going on here? The Seneca on the shortness of life essay or letter as it was originally formed was the thing I enjoyed most in preparation mm. for the episode. It's something I haven't read before. And 
Uh, I highly recommend it. It's only 15, 20 pages long. So if you're going to read something off the back of this episode, I'd put that top of your list. He kicks off the essay with essentially the point you were making there, that, quote, men do not allow anyone to take their possessions of their estates. Mm. They rush to pick up stones and weapons. So if I was to start rummaging through your bag of rose or your huh. wallet, Ollie, you'd oh go, hey, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> what are you right? doing? Get out. And especially if I did that to a stranger on the street, right? And so I get a bit of slap, stuff. I think, as well. There, but when it comes to his life, says Seneca, each one of us gives others a share in it. And many, many others. And how many others? And will you help me carry this up the stairs? That doesn't seem as intrusive as, can I rummage through your belongings? <laughs> <laughs> can you pick me up from the airport? And so what he thinks is that all of these forces, all of these societal pressures or responsibilities, whether it's family or friends or work, we give away our time quite loosely and we don't give it a second's thought. And we end up filling our lives with lots of things that are meaningless. So to sunbathe, for example. Mm. Yeah, it might be better like if you freely chose that yourself, that that's what you wanted to do. But more than likely, it's what you the expectation of you or a lower order pleasure or a, a brutish appetite, Seneca would think. He thinks the only way you can usefully use your time is to engage in philosophy. Of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> so it's even, I love, there's a couple of quotes from which I thought were good. Here's a great one on whether or not you should. So he thinks the reason why we think life short is because we fill it with meaningless stuff. And if we filled it with meaningful stuff like philosophy, then life wouldn't feel like it's slipping through our hands. But that's not to say you can just do any old philosophical question. It has to be a meaningful one. Oh, okay. He says, quote, It was a foolish passion once confined to Greeks to inquire into whether the Iliad or the Odyssey was written first. Should you make such passions <laughs> public, you increase your reputation, not as a scholar, but as a bore. <laughs> Brilliant. I like that a lot. That's really, really good. Although that's quite an important question, I would probably say. There you go. <laughs> to get back to practical wisdom in the context of Berkman is that we should cultivate patience, right? So we're not saying here that the philosophical life is the only one that's worth living. What we're saying is that you should accept the fact you're a finite being and you shouldn't live as if your life was going to go on forever. And that doesn't mean rushing through as much as you can, but it means taking the time that's intrinsic to the acts which you're completing. The point is also distraction, right? So he kind of says that a distracted person never chooses to do the thing they want to do. Their attention's been grabbed or taken by forces outside of their control uh, and may not necessarily have their best intentions at heart. So what are we saying here? Are we saying that, okay, Seneca's saying you can never do a nice thing for another person because it's taking your time? No, of course not. That's not what he's saying. You know, if you do believe that by helping another person, that's a really useful and good thing to do and a good use of your time, you should do it. Absolutely. And you you can definitely tell he's in like a political sphere, I think, at the time here too. The idea that there's lots of people that may distract you and take up your time, but it's not actually meaningful, well-willed or authentic people that have good intentions of using up your time. It may be that people are using you as a means to an end, or people may be, for example, trying to trip you up with Mm -hmm. language and stuff like that. Actually, you should take an authentic choice to be like, no, this is what I'm doing. This is what I want to focus on. And that's kind of how why Berkman uses him as an example, I think, right? So you could replace politicians in ancient Rome for TikTok, right? Like, is TikTok a meaningful use of your time? It could be very entertaining. You could sit down and watch a couple of TikToks in five minutes and be very happy. But if you're just spending a whole day on TikTok, is that, again, a meaningful use? Are you choosing then to just get distracted from actually what the other things that are more meaningful? The best way to phrase this is in terms of what Rose kicked us off with authenticity. And perhaps we've strayed a little far from the path there and trying to make sure our lives are authentic and the fact they're meaningful. So if everything you do is for some other end, if it's always in pursuit of some future good, which will never arrive, then everything is extrinsically valuable. And that strips life of its intrinsic value. Mm. So how can we make sure that we're getting the value of life in and of the moment? Well, to cultivate patience to those who have experienced meditation or engaged in sport or played music or engaged in a philosophical conversation, things like that, where you kind of lose yourself in what Carl Jung calls the stillness of eternal being, the world as it had always been in a state of non-being. That meaningful productivity comes through letting activities take the time they take rather than trying to get through as much as possible. Yeah, I think he makes a really interesting point with that about how our need to hurry even stops us doing things that we actually want to do. So even if we're settling down to work on something that we're really passionate about to do, well, firstly, we have the problem of distraction. 
but also we find it uncomfortable that it's not something that we can rush. So we immediately are seeking distraction and also not enjoying what we're doing. So he really is trying to say, but you know, you might feel discomfort because you've dedicated your time to something and you're mm. forfeiting other choices. Um, but your real experience begins once you become okay with that comfort and you're willing to set aside the other options to get into deeply into what you're doing. And there's a really brilliant example in the book, user of this is with a famous art historian called Jennifer Roberts, who works at Harvard, who's trying to teach her students the importance of patience. And how do you make this really explicit, right? Brilliant thing you can do. Right, guys, you're going to go into the art gallery. Okay. And what you got to do, you got to pick one piece of art. So it could be a sculpture, it could be a painting, whatever. And you've got to look at it for three hours. No break, no phone. You can go to the toilet. That's yeah, fine. She begrudgingly gives you a toilet. Begrudgingly, <laughs> but to be honest, you probably shouldn't drink anything before you, you go. You won't be the class favorite if no, you, if you can't you go, to go, the, go to the bathroom. Can't go to the cafe and get some gifts and stuff from the gift shop. <laughs> You've got to stare at this piece of art for three hours. And Berkman explains his own process of doing this. He was like, okay, I'll give this a go. And it's, it's quite a funny description in the book, actually. He says that like for the first like 10 minutes, he's like, man, I really should have picked another piece of art. This one is not that interesting. <laughs> um, he doesn't name it, fortunately. And then, then he says that he kind of goes through the process and then he's like, oh, okay, well, now I've been looking at it. Actually, I didn't quite notice that this brush stroke here actually is like a mirror of this mm. other object here. Okay, that's something I've noticed now. Wow. And that actually, after the three hours, he does say it does feel way longer than three hours. And it's really <laughs> hard to just not be distracted by everyone around you who's just walking through, glancing at it for 30 seconds and moving on. Mm. But actually, this kind of being forced to not just look, but see, really changes your perspective on time. And I think that's a really brilliant example of how you can take that idea of like, actually, you know, there's lots of different things in life, like Rose said, that we might just hurry through, that we don't yeah. actually give the time to them. And I think that that practice is a really interesting uh, example of actually forcing someone to slow down and be patient. Yeah. And he really tries to highlight how the rushing is, again, coming back to avoiding our question of mortality, because mm. it's trying to keep us as a feeling in control that we can get everything done. And it really boils back to that, the feeling of always being in a rush. I think the point of Roberts's first assignment to go and stare at a piece of art for three hours is that she says that you need a different type of approach to time to engage in something like art. And Ollie, you joked off microphone that you definitely would regret taking a class. <laughs> um, and I, I, when I found myself reading this example, I thought I might bring this in for philosophy. Yeah, like nice. for, for first year's like philosophical toolkit to be like, well, here is how we should approach philosophy. It's not like philosophize three, two, one, go. It's not like the other things you do in your life, like doing the dishes or trying to cram as much as, as you can into a morning. It takes time. It takes a lot of patience and that's a good lesson to learn from the outset yeah i agree and i think you can you can even switch the example right so if your listeners probably thinking like i'm not going to go and sit in an art gallery for three hours and stare at a sculpture okay cool how about just reading a book so mm. i think that you know someone who reads quite a lot and that's not a humble brag you know for the podcast we've got to research our stuff right <laughs> um lots of people i talk to are actually oh, you know what i haven't read a book in last year or i haven't yeah. read in years i just don't have the time to read i'm just so busy with work kids my car my a other thing i just don't have any time because you know if you're going to sit and read like something philosophical or a novel like you have to go at the pace of the book yeah and actually reading personally i find really difficult because it's so slow you really have to get into a rhythm of if you want to understand something especially we have to read some quite dense philosophy it takes you have to read the same passage like two or three times and it's you really have to go at the pace of what you're reading and I think that's a, another wonderful example that Berkman would approve of, of actually that's a really good thing, making the time for that. Yeah. If you're just going to read a novel, like sit down and read Pride and Prejudice, right? Go at the pace of the novel. It's achingly slow. It's not going to be as fun as the movie, right? Which has got glamorous actors fast cutting into loads of different things. You have to go at the pace of the, of the art itself. And I think that for a lot of people in their everyday life, yeah, if you're thinking like, I'm not going to go see an art gallery, fine read a novel and go at the speed of the novel, right? That will give you that patience. That will teach you actually, you know what, maybe I should slow down a little bit. Personal reflection. I found this a, a really interesting insight again in, in my own life when you go and do a different sort of task, like mm. when uh, renovating like an apartment or something and sanding walls and, mm. and that kind of stuff feels, oh, it's taking forever. But if you allow yourself to sink into the moment and accept the fact it's going to take a lot of time, then all of a sudden it feels way less laborious and I feel way less overwhelmed. Yeah, that's really how he describes his experience as well, is that first you feel the frustration and he describes 
you know, always looking at his phone and really feeling fiddly. And then once he actually gets into it, it's tasks like sanding and you know that you can't rush it, then you really go into a flow of concentration. Yeah, it really depends on what you're doing, right? So if you're refurbing an apartment, there's like an end goal, right? Which mm. is like, I want this apartment to look brilliant so mm. people can live in it. But if it's something like gardening, I mean, gardening's never done. You're never like, yep, that's yeah. the garden, and it's going to look like that all season, year, whatever. Depends and it's what you do to your garden. Well, it depends what kind of garden you have. If you're lucky enough to have a garden, and I think that's a really good way of looking at it, right? A garden's never finished, quote unquote. Yeah. It's something you maintain and tinker with and try and organize against the chaos of the natural world, which is consistently trying to unorganize it. Yeah. And I think that's a, another way of looking at the kind of the, what he's trying to say here. It's about constant maintenance as opposed to rushing through a thing mm. so it's done so you can move on to the next thing. I'm very impressionable when it comes to reading philosophy and trying it out mm. again when we're reading it and seeing if it has positive improvements and stuff for our lives. And we had a huge storm here up in England, didn't we, a couple we of weeks did. ago? Yes. And my motorbike was knocked over in the wind and it had like the wing mirrors both smashed and oh, no. the side panel had fallen off. That's terrible. It left outside for a week or so because the weather was that bad. So the chain had rusted and the exhaust had. And then talking about prioritizing and sinking your teeth into a moment and getting that kind of chewiness from the moment in and of itself. I put down my philosophy books for the day and went to a friend's on my bike and showed him the damage and stuff and got my tools out and started at something I, I wouldn't normally have patience for. I said, like, that's going to take forever. And I remember saying to him like, good, like I'm actually <laughs> looking forward to just enjoying this experience. And normally I'd just be like, get it done as quickly as I can so I can go back and get some more work done or something. And I think that's a, I mean, the next installment in further analysis of the discussion, I imagine we've got a few things to say in terms of criticisms of the book. Mm -hmm. But I think this was a real highlight in terms of practical advice, that basic mindfulness that the Buddhists and the Stoics and so many other of the philosophies of life we've looked at preach. And he really drums that home, the, the significance of it. One thing perhaps which isn't as prominent in those more holistic traditions of philosophy of life is the emphasis they put place on prioritizing what's important to us. And as someone who hasn't really engaged with much literature and self-help, I thought Berkman, again, gave us a few good examples. He, he says this next example we're going to talk about isn't very cool or like isn't very original. <laughs> he kind of makes fun of the students and people that like this example. Do you want to, do you want to play it? Should we play it out? Do you want to be a professor? Oh, yeah, a kooky professor. Sure, I love being a kooky professor. Are we going to talk about the, the rocks, the pebbles, and the sand? Yeah. So, frequently used prioritization metaphor. And actually, we're going to talk, I think, about how we kind of like, <laughs> we kind of yeah. like this. The problem. Okay, so, imagine you have a, a big empty glass jar, okay? I'm not going to give you a specific size. Just imagine that big glass jar in your head, okay? And we've got a certain amount of big rocks, okay? Some big rocks. Imagine your favorite rocks. I'm sure you have some. Okay, we've got some nice smooth pebbles. They're much smaller than the big rocks. Yep. They're there, yeah, they're from the beach. And we've got some sand as well. Let's go on, you've gone to the beach, you've got rocks, pebbles, and sand. It's been brilliant, okay? <laughs> the professor hasn't done a lesson plan. Yeah, they yeah. explain everything in a remarkable <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guys, this is the next hour. Can we do this ourselves? No, we <laughs> just need wrong. to listen to me explain rocks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So the way this metaphor goes, so, okay, right. So you need to fit all of these things inside the jar, okay? Off you go, right? And people were, they're throwing the sand in first, right? Some people were just throwing the pebbles in first. Some people might be smart and putting the rocks in first. So, so what happens? If you put the sand in first, what happens? Yeah. It fills up, you put the little rocks in, and then you can't fit the big rocks in. So you can't fit everything into the jar. You put the pebbles in first, brilliant, sand, that goes in, that fills in some of the space, but still there's not enough space for those big rocks, right? So the right way to do it is big rocks first, then the pebbles, then the sand, okay? And we can take this as a metaphor for prioritizing your tasks. Take the big, most important things, okay? Do those first and prioritize them. Then the little things that aren't as important, and then eventually the sand is everything else. And this is one apparently very common in a lot of self-help literature. I haven't personally come across it myself before. What do we think about this? Do we think this is a nice metaphor? Does, does this work? I hate to put the doom and gloom on it, but I've read it a few times before because oh, really? it's, oh, yeah. it, it's all over LinkedIn, isn't it? This is the kind of... <laughs> is it? Yeah. I'm not on LinkedIn. You're not on LinkedIn. All <laughs> oh, right, is LinkedIn yeah, there? This, LinkedIn is variations of this metaphor over and over <laughs> yeah. again. And then someone's like doing a poll like, should we pay workers? And people are like, no. <laughs> <laughs> the Sankey professor once told me. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Covey's book, First Things First from 1994 is the first time that this appears. Is. But yeah, it's the I like the metaphor. I think it's nice. I think it's engaging. And if you had some very dim 
long-witted students. It would be a very good way to hook them into a lesson. And I think the message of it is, again, really helpful. Mm. Like, philosophically rich and profound. Yeah. Perhaps not, yeah. but, like, self-help. Yeah, if you want to do the important things and you want to get yeah. them accomplished, then do yeah. them first. Pay yourself first, Bergman yeah. says. Planning my wedding, big rock. Okay, yeah. planning what I'm going to eat for dinner, bit of sand. Okay, you don't mm-hmm. want to prioritize what you're going to eat for dinner over the person you're marrying, right? But I think that's a bit of a... <laughs> it depends right? what you're interested well, in. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, it's prioritizing. <laughs> you, you decide what the yeah. big rocks are. Berkman, not a big fan though, is he, Rose, of this particular metaphor? No, so he really, yeah, is trying to do a big plot twist and trying to cram in how it's not a good metaphor. So the reality is that there are just too many rocks. I mean, you just cannot physically fit them all in. You could go to a beach and the whole beach would be full of rocks. And it's not what the professor brought into class with him. Mm -hmm. So the professor is really sort of tricking his students here. So his point is that we actually have much too many big rocks to fit into this jar. And this is really important and time management gurus just don't really look into that. They overlook it. And what he's saying is that, no, we are going to have to make sacrifices and decide really what are the biggest of those big rocks to do. Doesn't he give some practical advice as to how to decide which rocks we should be picking up from the beach? Um, Yeah, so his advice really is all about deciding what to neglect so that you can leave room for the important things. So he has three principles for that. So the first one is what a phrase that Jessica Abel coined, which is to pay yourself first. So if you have something really important to do, it's to really make it that your priority and to do a little bit of it every day to make sure that it happens. Uh So no matter what else you're setting aside, like accept the consequences of letting your to-do list build up and your emails build up and accept that that might be uncomfortable and actually do the big task that you're actually wanting to be doing. So that's the first one. And then the second one is to limit your work in progress. It's resisting the temptation to start a whole lot of projects at the same time. So that might let you feel that you're in control, but you're not actually getting anything done. So it's more beneficial to really concentrate on on one, a single important project at a time. And then his last one is to resist the temptation of middling priorities. So to resist your middling priorities, he gives advice of making a list of the 25 top things that you want to do in life. Yeah. And then out of those 25 things, look at the five things. And those are your, really your top, top things that you should be concentrating on. And then you have to actively concentrate to not do the other 20 things because they're the temptations that you have to set aside because they're fairly interesting and fairly enjoyable and they're things that you probably want to do but you should really actively fight against doing them great so this is all about again embracing your finished shoot isn't it i can't do 25 things i can't cram it all in yeah. focus on the five most important and make sure those five most important things i'm doing a little bit of each day that i'm always working towards them one of the best texts i read last year was that i said i don't read much self-help but Uh, Eugene Agus Howard did an interview with what it's like to be a philosopher. Mm. And in that, I think he was asked the question, like, how do you do so much? And he recommended a book by Paul Sylvia, which is How to Write a Lot, A Practical Guide to Productive Academic Writing. I read this really short. And that advice was just that. Just write a little bit every day and stop when you've done it. Just make sure you keep chipping away at it. And that allows you to accomplish and focus on the things that are meaningful and that they matter. And you're not just trying to do bureaucracy and ticking off all those emails. Like there's more, <laughs> there's better things in life to be getting on with. And, and that's certainly true. Hallelujah. And I think it's <laughs> worth saying as well that it's not just about, because he mentions as well that it's people get obsessed with the completing of the task mm. and not actually thinking about work or what you've got to do in terms of like time. So even if it's something as simple as some people may say, well, I'm not going home at the end of the day. So I've got all of my emails done, all of my work done. Well, Bergman actually says, well, what about just leave work at 5.30 every day? Every day you will leave work at 5.30. And then you're changing the perspective of your own work, which is, you know what? I didn't get all of my work done today, but it's 5.30 and I have other responsibilities, other big rocks that I need to sort out, whether it's my family or my other priorities that are important to me. So therefore, you're not in a position then where you kind of resent the things you're doing and that you can better then prioritize. And I I like the example. I like the fact that actually like he kind of critiques the idea of the kind of big rocks and that the game is rigged, right? Because some people are born with 10 rocks. Some people are born with like one. And that throughout your life, you know, depending on your age or what experiences you've been through or what's happening to you, 
you know, your amount of big rocks really does change a lot. So like, you know, if you're job hunting, that's a big rock, right? That's a yeah. really big thing to overcome. And that you get a job, that rock disappears pretty much. So yeah, that's not taken into account with the metaphor. It's almost as if metaphors are sometimes flawed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to all of our loyal patrons for joining us for another episode of the Pan Cast. In particular, a very special thank you to Achieving Eternal Life and Boredom in the Kingdom of Heaven, it's St. David Ligeness. The older he gets, the better he tastes. It's John Breeden. Living the life of leisure, that is, mountain climbing and chewing furniture, it's John Gautier. Satan finds mischief for idle lips. Watch out for Michael Kisley. Every breath is a gift, that is, according to Jamie Lung. Avoiding the funeral processions of daily commuters in pursuit of a leisurely stroll, it's Jay Wheelless. And finally, the man with more free time than his name has syllables, it's Maron van der Kolk. If you, dear listener, want to help us seize the day and bring the world more timeless leisure, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into the discussion. It's not the case, though, that we want to be like Sisyphus and just push a rock for the sake of it and just keep pushing <laughs> How many it. rocked puns are we going to put? <laughs> oh, no, we do want to be doing it for the sake of it, sorry. So it's not just that you pick these five things and you should do them, like you say, to pursue some goal that exists in the future. Hmm. There are particular types of things that we should be picking as our rocks and there are a way in which we should be approaching the activities which involves the pushing of those rocks. And as the cat in the hat says, it's fun <laughs> to have fun, but you have to know how. <laughs> <laughs> that philosopher, Dr. Zeus. Yeah. And this comes to a point again, which is in religious traditions and lots of work in philosophy and the philosophy of life. And that is presentism or accepting or having a sort of mindfulness in the way you approach those things that do matter, not just trying to get through them, but accepting the fact that you are here and focusing on using your time well and trying to make sure like each day is something that we need to get through is to go against what is authentic or meaningful living. So stop using it as an instrument to the future. And when we go to concerts or on holidays, People are so intent on using that time well as well. They think, I, oh, I need to make sure I'm in this moment. I need to make sure I'm enjoying this leisure. And they put pressure on themselves to do so. I thought a great example in the book was from Zen and the Art and for Motorcycle Maintenance for Robert Persig. And he describes a scene where the characters arrive at a crater in Oregon. And quote, we see the crater lake with a feeling of, well, there it is. <laughs> and we've all been there when we go to like an art gallery or go to a show and you go to see, you climb a big mountain or you drive and want to see a view. And you're like, oh, well, we've seen it. Uh, let's go. You need to make sure that you're actually living in that moment and you're absorbing the present and not for some other end. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting one, which lots of people might have had quite a vivid experience of. So anyone who's ever been on holiday or traveled with friends or partners will know that people tend to have very different approaches to travel in the sense of some people really enjoyed the process of traveling, right? Getting on a train or I would say getting on a bus. I know many people enjoy bus travel, but you know, it's <laughs> fine, I guess. The excitement of getting on a plane, right? And going somewhere new and exciting. And there's some people that are very much like they will plan every five minutes of their holiday, right? We need yeah. to go to this place. There's a long list of we need to go to this cafe. Apparently this restaurant's really nice. And then we can finish off here. And they're all on Google Maps figuring it out with a big spreadsheet. And there's other people that are just like, let's just go with the flow, right? Let's just figure it out and then what is a more authentic experience. And I don't think either is particularly 100% on it. Yeah. I think Berkman's kind of encouraging a little bit of like, you know, obviously organize and plan your travel with the people you want to travel with, but don't over plan it because then it becomes, you're not living in the moment then because you're not, maybe if an opportunity arises and you're like, oh, wow, there's a carnival on, let's go and see that. No, 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 it's not on the plan because we said we'd go to these five other things today. In a sense, he's definitely leaning towards the latter, as he suggested there. He's saying, don't add to the storeroom of your experiences just so you feel like you've used your time well. That's not mm. what you should be doing. And he quotes the Tao Te Ching, trying to control the future is like trying to take the master carpenter's place. Or he quotes your boy JC in the Bible, take no <laughs> thought for the morrow, for the morrow <laughs> shall thought for the things of itself. He does think that you should just be embracing the present moment. He doesn't think you should be always looking for the future. He doesn't think you should be taking photos or videoing the concert that you're at. Oh, don't get me started on that. You should be actually <laughs> just one that you're never going to see again, just to make that 
thing that should be an end in itself instrumental to some other ends, which is to be enjoyed in the future. He thinks that captures the problem in, in a nutshell. Yeah, for him, when he really was struck by this point is that in bringing up children and how most of the focus is how they turn out of adults rather than actually putting focus on how they enjoy being a child, mm. simply. You have the same with mothers as well. And you know, The raising of the child is seen as what the child will come out as in the future, yeah. what kind of child it produces. And that strips away the intrinsic value of having a child. And it might not be great. It might be a bad habit for a one-year-old to sleep on your chest, but it's also a really nice experience, he says, a delightful experience in the present moment. And the future shouldn't always take precedent. Yeah. yeah. I really like the bit as well where he talks about Henry Bergson, which is a philosopher that I was not that much aware of, actually, before I read this book and did a little bit of research on him, connecting to this idea of living in the moment and present. So for those of you who don't know Henry Bergson, he's a late 19th, 20th century French philosopher. Actually, he was quite famous in his day, but because of some, he had some quite strong views towards Einstein's theory of relativity, apparently, and apparently he was a bit of a, <laughs> an arch nemesis of Bertrand Russell. So he's kind of <laughs> fell out of favor in, in the modern day, but apparently lots of people have actually tried to kind of reclaim his work. He was quite famous. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1927 and was quite close friends with Marcel Proust as well, who actually wrote a book about time based on his work on time. Uh, now, he's got a very complex metaphysics, so we're not going to get into that. If you want to you know, have a little research on Henry Bergson, please do so. But I think that there's a really interesting thing that's mentioned in the book about time itself. So Bergson argues effectively that time has two faces. You have objective time, and this is times like watches, calendars, train timetables, objective time that we can all agree on. I can say it is 14.13 in the afternoon today, and hopefully we can all agree if our laptops are synced up. Um, but he also says there's this other type of time, which he calls duration or la durie, which is lived time, the time of our inner subjective experience. This time is, is felt, it's lived, and it's acted. And he argues that la durie is much more significant than objective time, that living in the present and having a, a conscious experience of the world is really, really important. And he uses an example of like, so let's say you've got the time between one o'clock in the morning and five o'clock in the morning, right? So four hours. So let's take two different experiences of those four hours, right? Let's say you're waiting for the dentist for four hours in a dentist office. Your experience of that is probably going to be pretty rubbish, right? It's going to be awful. You're going to be sat there being like, what is this dentist doing? Why am I being here so long? It's going to be quite stressful. Whereas if you're at a party, between one and five in the morning is when it gets started, baby. It's going to be brilliant, <laughs> right? So you're having a great time. And like I've had, I'm sure many people listening have had to be like, wow, I went quick. Like I didn't realize it was like five o'clock in the morning. I should probably go to bed and have a good night's sleep. As <laughs> the ancient proverb goes, time flies. <laughs> <laughs> when you're having fun. Yeah. But I think this is a really nice way of looking at it. So maybe making that distinction between actually there is an objective time out there in the world uh -huh. that we can measure, but actually the priority should be this la durie. And actually this idea that that inner subjective experience of time, whether you are at a concert, like Jack said, or if you're on holiday, or if you are uh, you know, at a party, that time changes. It actually, your experience of it is very, very different. And that we should prioritize the types of experience that give us that sense of like la durie and duration, like where you're just living in the moment and not necessarily just focusing on objective minutes and seconds. I mean, as a teacher, I mean, I'm talking about this all the time with students, right? So stop looking at the clock because the more you look at it, the slower it's going to go, right? <laughs> Your if lessons you just, sound really fun. <laughs> I have very famously very boring lessons. Uh, but yeah, but this idea that actually it's true, right? If you're just constantly clock, you know, you find it with people with different types of work as well. Yeah. If you're just constantly clock staring, I used to do a cleaning job many years ago where it was literally a clock staring job where you were just mm. so mentally unstimulated you would just go crazy but clock watching made it far worse yeah i know people that have clean jobs who listen to the pan psychast and time flies when they do so we got a couple of oh, appraisals nice. on the maybe side we could it. say the pan psychast is evidence of ladder there we go yeah. <laughs> a point to touch on before we look at the concept of leisure is very briefly on the concept of distraction and here's a good quote from mary oliver the self within the self that whistles and pounds upon the doors, panels, promising for an easier life if only you'd redirect your attention away from the meaningful but challenging task at hand. And we all have this, don't we, when we're reading a book, when we're in a classroom or when we're doing our jobs. Sometimes we just need a little something to help us tick over, a little glance mm. at social media, a, you know, a little coffee in the other room. Gossip. A little bit of gossip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Berkman says is that whenever we succumb to this distraction, we're attempting to flee a painful encounter mm. with our finitude. That by being distracted, we're saying, I don't want this to be all that there is. I want to still keep my options open. I don't want this to be the intrinsic value that is my life. There's got to be more to it than this. 
And so, quote, what we think of as distractions aren't the ultimate cause of our being distracted. I can't help but think, like, oh, we'll talk about in the next section, that perhaps he collapses or stretches the problem of time further than it is. I don't yeah. think I'm escaping my finish you when I, I check my phone. definitely agree with that. I think you're probably just escaping the fact of having to do hard work. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you just want and to put it off. The, the, the path of yeah. resis- resistance, right? Yes. Yeah, and I think if you look at human beings, if you look at specifically like Berkman's job, which is a writer, right? And, uh, and like, imagine being a writer. Imagine like walking into a social situation and be like, I'm a writer. Oh, that sounds like, what sort of things do you write? And you can, go, but when in the, in the moment day to day, it's a boring job. You are sat normally inside with a laptop or a mm. pen and you are thinking and typing or writing and actually day to day i can imagine that even for the most engaged person who's writing about the most important issues to do with like social justice and the environment and really like passionate important things you mm. must have like man i really am bored you know people who have written things know that you know your dissertations your essays yeah. whatever you've got to write by the end of it you're like i am so bored of this and i want to break yeah <laughs> and the, the, the sounds and the colors on my phone make me Ooh, want to look at it right? yeah, yeah they make me feel good the taste of coffee makes me feel good like people that go for cigarette breaks all the time as rose mentioned in, in the last installment like they're addicted to it not because of the finitude of time they're not there to say oh I don't it's a nicotine jacket <laughs> yeah. it's simply the chemical that gets them out there yeah. so perhaps that's stretching it too far but that's in the spirit of the self-help book that we're reading the overstating the rhetoric of the text and motivating to someone to follow the advice comes before truth perhaps and in this case but again we'll pick up on that in the next installment further analysis Probably the main way of keeping in the present is to really purposefully reclaim spending time on things which are not for the purpose of something else. Mm. So refraining from using your time, your free time on doing activities will, which will look good for your CV or personal growth or learning a new language and actually do something just for the sake of doing it and enjoying that present moment. So something Berkman mentions in the book, doesn't he, about how the ancient Greeks, why did they work so hard? Which is kind of a little bit funny, the fact that, you know, most of them were slave owners, but sure. You know, why did they work so hard? And it's for leisure time, so they could enjoy their leisure time and do what they wanted to do. And you kind of, you know, this critique of the quote unquote modern world is that actually a lot of activities people do are not actually because they're good in of themselves or for just because they enjoy them in their own right, but it's to get another thing. So Jack, you're a a keen gym goer. Why do you go to the gym? Who's Jim? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I go to hang out with them, have a cup of tea to make sure my relationship with them sustains into the long term future. Okay, well, I don't obviously. go to see them for the sake of itself. I go out of a sense of getting something out of it, like tea. So most people go to the gym to normally exercise, don't they? Why do people exercise? Why do people like exercising? Why you're having a cup of tea with Jim? So they can prolong their life, so mm. they can look good on the beach when they're mm. sunbathing. Things like that. Yeah. yeah, and that's fine. I don't think um, you know Boatman's going to say, "Oh, you know, you should never exercise." But you're doing something to get something else. You very rarely meet people who are like, you know what I love? Going to the gym. It ruins my health. Yeah. It's terrible for me, but I just really, really enjoy the process of hanging around in a big sweaty building with loads of other people exercising. Well, Bertrand Russell gives a similar example about people who work for a living rather than people who just manage them, essentially. And they're sold the lie that manual work is an end in itself for the human life. That it's a great virtue in and of itself. And he says, a worker would never say, quote, I am never so happy as when the morning comes and I can return to the toil from which my contentment springs. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> it's always for the weekend. It's for Friday. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is what we could refer to as like a telic way of looking at your hobbies, potentially, mm-hmm. or the things you do outside of work. So if we look at a specific book called Midlife, A Philosophical Guide, which is a brilliant name for a book by Kieran Setia. This book is focused on this idea of looking at your hobbies and your interests outside of work. And they argue that actually the things like going to the gym or things where you're just doing them, like learning a language, Rose said, for something else, isn't actually going to give you that sense of fulfillment. And I'm actually going to quote uh, Massimo Pigliucci now, who's written an article about this book. So he says, Atelic activities are done for their own sake, not in order to achieve a particular end. For instance, In case you go out for a walk just because you like walking, or if you play a sport not because you want to become a professional, impress others, but because you like it in of itself. The activity is its own reward. And unlike the Telic case, 
is potentially endlessly renewable. So the idea that actually we should be doing these a tillic activities, mm-hmm. things which we enjoy in of themselves because we love them, because we really enjoy doing them, as opposed to these telic ones like potentially going to the gym or something like the others mentioned, where it's just to get another skill or to make more money or et cetera. Yeah, and I think a point he makes about that is about how those telic activities won't bring satisfaction because you're either always in a state of wanting to complete it or in a state where you've completed it and so you're not interested in it anymore and you're looking for something else. So they don't bring that permanent satisfaction that atelic activities would bring. And there's lots of different examples we could use for this, right? So sport's probably quite a nice one. So the idea of there's a big difference between like, okay, I am a 100 meter sprinter. I need to train and practice for my 100 Mm. meter sprint, which I'm doing in the Olympics in 2027. It's going to be a big deal. I've got to train, 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 train. That's a very telic way of looking at it as opposed to someone who's like, you know what? I want to practice my 100 meter sprint or I just want to play a game of football. I don't want to be a professional football player, but I really enjoy the game. I find it really fun. And for me, it's good in of itself, even if I don't necessarily get better at it. And Bertrand Russell makes a similar point again. He thinks that we had a cultural shift in which, in one instance, we thought that to work was to be able to enjoy our leisure time. Mm. And it's been flipped. And now that we go on holiday, we go on holiday to recharge for work. We have the weekend to make sure we can be good at our jobs again on Monday so we don't burn out. So the end now is work rather than the end, which Berkman says would be appropriate, and Russell says too, is the end should be leisure. And Russell also makes an interesting uh, remark in which he says that the reason why we've stopped engaging in things like sports or choirs or political organizations that require literal physical energy is because work takes that from us. And then by the time we get home, it's put the television on. I just want to relax. I just want to turn my mind off. I'm exhausted. I need to get recharged for work. And Russell thinks that if we can limit the amount of time we're actually spending at work, we can refine leisure and meaningful leisure and the types of leisure which are possible when we're not exhausted. That goes back as well if, to union leaders who campaign for time off. And often it's the campaign and the argument is that time off makes employees better and mm. more hardworking and all of that. So it's again the attitude that rest is just for the purpose of being fresh for work. And I think it's interesting in the book itself, Bertman very much gives some personal examples from his own life. So he's a person who really enjoys hiking. This is something which he confesses to be not particularly good at. And I don't know how you would create a criteria for hiking apart from speed, right? I'm not sure. I'm not in the hiking yeah, maybe. community. Maybe there's some competitive hiking out maybe there. Maybe the I'm not kit. Sure. Maybe the kit. Yeah, the quality of your boots. Yeah, like if you're a good <laughs> hiker, that you can go a long distance and you can do that long distance in a good amount of time. But the thing is with hiking, Jack, because it's a loop, isn't it? You don't hike to a destination, you hike to a destination and back again. That's normally how hiking works. So ultimately, it's completely pointless. It doesn't really have a purpose, (laughs) apart from the fact that you are, in theory, enjoying the present moment of being rained Mm -hmm. on, of seeing some sheep potentially, or enjoying the environment of the natural countryside around you. I can't imagine many people go hiking around cities. That'd be a bit strange. I've done a few hikes in in Wales over the last few years, far fewer than I'd, I'd like to say. But when you get to the top of the mountain, Ollie, they're all taking selfies. They're all there for the pictures. <laughs> Isn't there a problem in Everest? Yes, Everest, Everest huge yeah. queue of people because they're all taking photographs. <laughs> they're not doing it for the sake of itself. But when we engage in activities like sports or when you're watching a band at a gig or when you're like surfing in the water or something, I have a friend who always makes fun of me. He came out with my brother and two sisters surfing with us in Cornwall and he mm. was like, why do you join? It's like being at one with the waves and stuff. Like that. It's just like, <laughs> it's, like it doesn't matter about being good at it. Yes. Right. Yeah. I don't care if you catch anything. And the same with play chess with a friend. And I don't care how rubbish I am at it. Mm. We've I, played chess before and been both of us. Yeah. Awful. So <laughs> I, I played chess for like two, three years with my friend and neither of us wanted to get good at it. We just wanted to do it for the sake of itself yeah. and enjoy it. And then I joined a school and they were like, oh, you play chess. Will you be captain? Will you be manager of the chess team? I was like, yeah, sure. I was fired within like six months. (laughs) We we didn't win a single game. We got any strategies, sir? No. (laughs) Enjoy it. (laughs) Are you having a good time? Thanks, coach. (laughs) Then you're winning. (laughs) But this this is interesting though, isn't it? Because Berkman implies that hobbies, I like this phrasing, are almost subversive. Yeah. Because everyone is so geared towards, no, if you play chess, you must be good at it or you have Mm. to get better at it, right? And actually, if you look at like specific hobbies, you know, they're almost like butts of jokes, like stamp collecting, he mentions in the book too, right? Like a lot of people be really dismissive, like, 
why on earth would you want to collect stamps? Mm. What's the point of that? Well, there is no quote unquote point. That's just the thing that someone enjoys doing. Yeah. And um, there's a great bit in the book where he mentions Rod Stewart. For those of you who don't know, a bit younger, I guess, a 70s rock singer, very famous for singing. Do you think I'm sexy? Yes. Uh, oh, not, no, the song, I know the song. Yeah, very funny. Also, yes. Yes, yes, yeah. So apparently Rod Stewart is a massive big fan of model train sets. Like yeah. he collects and in his, again, in his own words, he doesn't really know a lot about trains or how trains work, but he's really into like model train sets. And apparently the model train set community have embraced him because of that. And he's done interviews in magazines and stuff like that, that it's something completely separate from like the quote unquote rock and roll lifestyle. Mm. Apparently he even like got rooms rented out in hotels to bring his model train sets on tour and yeah. stuff. And I just find that's really, really interesting. Uh, and like another example, I guess a more modern one. I don't know if anybody is aware of the train guy or Francis Bourgeois on TikTok who's this English guy from London and all he does is post TikToks of his own reactions to stuff which is train related. That guy's obsessed with trains. And it's weird <laughs> and very bizarre that this guy is very excited and he's quite posh as well. So it's quite funny to see him get really excited about like seeing the Flying Scotsman or seeing mm. a train pull up to a platform. But there's lots of like media discourse online about how it's really nice just to see a guy enthusiastically like a thing, like yeah. non-ironically. Yeah. He just really loves trains and being around them and getting the opportunity to be near them. I do think that when I see a train spotter, I think, why are you doing that? And this book's made me reflect on the fact, ah, they're doing it for the sake of itself. Yeah, yeah. Sake of they itself. have understood yeah. life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're having way more fun than I am. Yeah. Yeah. I'm worried about getting to my job on time, but they're actually embracing yeah. the, and I, and the I, point I, of life. That's one thing that I do like about the book. I think Bergman really onto something there where he says that hobbies are subversive because it's so easy I think to kind of ridicule other people for their interests and their hobbies Yeah, and it's really interesting to see that actually like actually when you are when you do come across someone in real life who's very very into a thing enthusiastically unironically it's kind of it's quite rare and it's quite bizarre sometimes but actually Berkman would say no that's what you should be doing right that's what your time should be used for if you love trains you go train mad okay just base all of your free time around trains well mm -hmm. no not too mad like you know. <laughs> But you know what I mean, right? Like, don't be like, oh, I'm, I can never do that because, you know, people would judge me or it's not going to give me a skill. He's like, fantastic. That's perfect. That's what you should be doing. So all of these solutions, I think, can be wrapped up with trying to find authenticity and meaning in life and not shying away from your 4,000 weeks and the limited time you have on Earth. And I thought a great story within the, the text itself, the example of Danielle Steele, who wrote 179 books before she was 72, she worked all of the time, 24-hour days. She was writing seven books per year, which is enormous. Doesn't she have like 190 books now? She's got an enormous amount anyway. But in an interview with Glamour magazine, she was saying that the loss of an adult son through an overdose, and I think she had several divorces as well, and quote, she said, this is where I take refuge. And she says something along the lines of, it's something that people can never take away from me, my work. And I found myself saying that about stuff in my life, and maybe you have as well, when you're working really hard on a project and it sort of consumes you, and you think, I'll just keep working and keep working. It's like, no, this is my thing. I have control over it. And this is the end within itself. But I think what Berkman's trying to encourage us to do is not to just fill our time with work, but actually reflect on our existence and our finitude and embrace the fact that one day we are going to die and the fact we should live in the present moment. One of my favorite quotes from Simone de Beauvoir's Memoirs of a Useful Daughter, which I think we've given on the show a very long time ago now, maybe it was the Simone de Beauvoir episode. In this entry of a memoir, she says the following, I made another discovery one afternoon in Paris. I realized that I was condemned to death. I was alone in the house and I did not attempt to control my despair. I screamed and tore the red carpet. And when, days, I got to my feet again, I asked myself, how do other people manage? How shall I manage too? It seemed impossible for me to live all through my life with such horror gnawing in my heart. When the reckoning comes, I thought, when you're 30 or 40, you think, it'll be tomorrow. How on earth can you bear the thought? Even more than death itself, I feared the terror that would soon be with me always. So she has this realization that one day she's going to die. And her reaction is that deep sense of dread, of anxiety of being overwhelmed that this is all that you've got. I think Berkman perhaps underplays just how big of a thing that is, that it does sit heavy on you, doesn't it, when you realize that this is it. But he's saying, no, you should realize this is it and that you should find pleasure in the life that you do have. And I think part of that as well is maybe facing your own finitude means facing the finitude of others, which I think 
is probably equally as hard as well mm. to accept that people who are meaningful in your life won't always be there. So I think that's also sort of an unpleasantness of facing finitude that maybe is overlooked in the seeking of trying to embrace it. Yeah. So perhaps we shouldn't be too harsh on Daniel still here. And he's certainly in the book. He does give a couple of footnotes on the topic. But I want to fill my time with doing lots of things so I don't have that overwhelming existential dread as described by Samindu before in that memoir. I think if someone took that approach to life, I don't think we should judge them too harshly. I feel like we're bordering on further analysis here, aren't we? Oh, yes. I think we really want to sink our own teeth into Oliver Berkman. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That sounds right. I thought that was the message of the book, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sink your teeth into him. We'll sink our teeth into Berkman in a fortnight's time in further analysis, but for now it will remain. Any guesses what's going to remain? A mystery. A mystery indeed. (laughs) The Mystery Philosopher. Welcome to Mystery Philosopher. Are you excited? Are you looking forward to the mystery of... I am so excited for Mystery Philosopher, Jack. A couple of weeks ago, I was really down on Mystery Philosopher, but I've realised it's actually the best bit of the show, and now I can't wait to win it. See, that's the new energy you've, you've brought with you, Rose. That's the <laughs> newfound pleasure and enjoyment of the present moment. <laughs> of the mystery yeah. philosopher and itself. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not to get through it. <laughs> to yeah. it to Can't wait room. till it's over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you get to enjoy every moment of it. Sink your teeth into this one. Why do you linger? Why do you do nothing? Unless you seize time, it runs away. Is that... Kafka? It's not Kafka. Okay. Not Franz Kafka. I can't think of any of who you could can't be. Think no. Of, it's a, is it in the is book? It a philo- is it a philosopher? It's a philosopher. It's a philosopher. Is it a living philosopher? It's a dead philosopher. A dead <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> that narrows it down. <laughs> I could have put that on the Are dead, really, when you think they, about it? They have no surviving family members, I'm sure. They, They're not that old. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a Stoic philosopher. Come on, Rose. Do you know any Stoic philosophers? Just Seneca. Seneca! Yes. Well, yes. Done. well done. That's one Seneca. all. <laughs> oh, no, you got two points last time. You got Ferris Bueller's Day Off. No, you give me the one. Film, I mean, next and you got a... Ferris Bueller. No, no, no. Next Do you know what a... piece of writing that's from, from Seneca? No, I don't. I don't know if I can go for that second it's, point. It's okay. I'm we'll, sorry. Make, we'll make it one all so the next part is a dramatic. Exciting. <laughs> well, if you want to enjoy that dramatic conclusion now and you just can't wait which you should because you should be more patient <laughs> if you haven't been listening for the last hour <laughs> and you still want to get everything in life immediately and now then you can go to patreon.com forward slash pansycast and show you support otherwise we'll see you in a couple of weeks time Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Psycast. The next installment of this episode will be available a week on Sunday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the next installment of the show. To support the podcast and get yourself heaps of extra perks, head over to www.patreon.com forward slash Pan or hit the link in the iTunes description. To find out more about the show and get all of our old episodes completely free, you can visit thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)